So over the past few weeks, Apostle Theo has been teaching on a subject that he titled, The Cross of Jesus Purchased Our Dominion. What a powerful teaching. What powerful truths from the Word of God. Would you agree with me? And it is the, the cross, the death, burial, and then the resurrection of Jesus that really sets us apart from any other belief system on this planet. And sometimes we might feel like we go through things in life and that we might be alone. But I want to remind you of this. Remember who is with you. Always remember who is with you. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, God says, I will never fail you. I will never forsake you. That is why we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will not be afraid. Can I have someone say amen there? Amen. Say that God said, He will never fail me and He will never forsake me. He will always help me because He cares about me. Evidently, two are better than one. God said it, and we should believe it. We are never, never, never alone in this world. Now, God might be invisible, but He's undeniable. Our Creator, our loving, caring, Heavenly Father, is standing right here beside us this very moment. Jesus said, with two or more gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. He is always with you. Often in the darkest times, He is the light that shines in the darkness and carries you through those times. In the times of celebration and the exciting times of life, He's still there with us celebrating and encouraging us on. He is the greatest cheerleader and the greatest advocate and greatest counselor of all. Now I understand much pressure, many obstacles, numerous problems have been thrust upon us by this world. And who has done that? Our enemy, Satan. We do have an enemy. And at least he provides an opportunity for choice. People often ask, why is there a devil? Why doesn't God just get rid of him? Well, God doesn't need the devil. But the devil does provide an opportunity for you to choose. The devil or God. If there was no, no need to choose, then why would we need to choose? Wow. Okay, never mind about that. <laughs> so all bad in this world is as a, a result of the curse of sin. All bad is the devil and all good is God. Say that all bad, all bad. is the devil and all good is God. Hallelujah. Now, does God even care? Does he even have a way out? Does he have a solution for all the things that we go through? He sure does. And many, but many people seem to think that um, the powers of good and evil are on an equal footing. Like yin and yang. It's like God and the devil are playing a game of cards for the souls of men or even a game of tug and war. And sometimes God wins some and sometimes the devil wins some. As if there is this equal power of evil and good. That is a big fat lie. There is no such evidence in all of Scripture. The devil is defeated. He's under our feet. Right? All authority, all power is in God. And we come with this religious thinking that God and the devil are on equal terms. And, you know, which way is it? No, 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 no. That's just propaganda from the pit of hell. It's designed to confuse, deceive those who don't know the truth. God is truth. The devil is a liar and there is no truth in him. I'm not saying that. God said that. A teacher asked her class, she said, Children, what is a lie? So silence. And in a moment, Johnny raised his hand in gusto and said, I know, I know. Teacher said, Yes, Johnny. He said, Teacher, a lie is an abomination unto God and a very present help in time of trouble. <laughs> now, the truth is, that there is absolutely no equality or comparison between God and the devil, right? God is wonderful. He's a good creator, and He cares about you. Say that God cares about me, and He's always good to me. See, the devil is a created being. He rebelled. 
in an instant like lightning, God quashed the rebellion and cast the devil and all those he had deceived out of heaven. He is no longer an issue in God's eyes. But that's a subject for another day. So the devil's only actions are to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God has always had a plan to rescue mankind. Why would he have a plan to rescue us? Because he cares. He cares. Jesus said the following about this rescue plan and restoration plan in John chapter 10. And Jesus is that plan. He said, I am the gate. So if you want to know how to get in, there is only one. And his name is Jesus. I am the gate. He didn't say, I am one of the gates. I am possibly an avenue. He said, I am the gate. Period. Those who come in through me will be saved. Not maybe, if you're good, will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So what does the enemy come to do? Steal, kill, and destroy. What does Jesus come to do? God's solution. So that Jesus, His purpose is to give me a rich and satisfying life. Why? He said, because He's the good shepherd. And the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. God is for you. God cares about us. Now we see here in Luke chapter 4 from verse 16, Jesus arrives in his hometown, or town he grew up in Nazareth. And he arrives, and as he arrives, he goes to church. As his custom was, right? <laughs> And they hand in the scroll, and he opens up the scroll to a specific point where the book of Isaiah is. And today we have as Isaiah, and he starts reading from what we today have as chapter 61. And he reads the following from verse, seven, uh, from verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released that the blind will see and that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Right? Spirit of the Lord is upon him. He's anointed. Good news to the poor, salvation, and everything that includes. He sent me to proclaim captives will be released. The blind will see, the oppressed will be set free, and the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. What is? That means blessing, favor of God will come. Then he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and he sat down. But he had an impact because all eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. That was a defining moment. This very day. So Jesus is a solution to all our problems. All spheres of life. For all ages and any age. He's relevant every single moment of every day. And what is his purpose? So this Jesus' purpose is to give us a rich and satisfying life. So God so loved us that he sent his only son, right? Verse John 3, 16. Verse 17 says, but he didn't send Jesus to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved. And when we tell people about Jesus, and that is the solution to all their problems, they might say, well, how do you know that he's the Son of God and that he is a solution to all of these problems? So I'm going to go with, give you that information this morning. And I'm telling you in advance, I encourage you, make some notes. You're going to want to listen to this again, because then someone says to you, you believe in Jesus, you say he's a solution to every problem? Yes. Well, how do you know? Show me some proof. What are you going to say then? Come to church with me. But we should have some more information. So let's have a look at the book of John. Because I heard a, a discussion on doctrinal issues a while ago, a, a very learned minister of God. And the question was, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And his answer was, yes, of course, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And then when he was probed a little bit further on the subject, 
He said, Jesus is the Son of God, just like you and I are sons of God. It's just that Jesus was more advanced in it than any of us have ever been. Talk about bringing the Son of God down to human level. Now on the earth, Jesus was the Son of Man. He could not go on the cross as the Son of God because He had to pay the price for us as human beings. And it's interesting that Jesus only referred to Himself as the Son of Man or the Son of a man, a man born from mankind. He never once referred to Himself as the Son of God. At His baptism, the Heavenly Father said, You are My Son in whom I am well pleased. At the cross, the centurion said, Surely this is the Son of God. But Jesus was always referring to himself as the Son of Man. Man died on the cross, a perfect man, to pay the price for the sinful man. God cares and he sent Jesus as a solution to all of mankind's problems. But who is this Jesus? To answer this question, I'm going to examine five passages of Scripture, and we're going to go through them fairly quick. But before we start at the beginning, let's go like many movies, start at the end, and then we'll go back, right? So let's go to John chapter 20, and John writes the following, because it sets the scene. He says in verse 30, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. Why are these signs written? This is why I want to show us. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that He is the anointed man, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. So here the Holy Spirit wrote the Gospel of John, not only to record, but also to set certain signs in a particular sequence so that He could show us the deity, the sonship of Jesus as the Christ. So if anyone asks you, how do you know he was the Son of God or is the Son of God? We can take him on this journey. And it's an exciting one. Now it's interesting that John says that all the signs and wonders that Jesus did, there's not enough space in this book and not enough space in all the books in the world to write them all. So the Holy Spirit wrote a specific group for us here and set a journey right here before us to follow. So let's have a look at what these signs and these miracles are all about. There are seven of them in the book of John. The first one, the first public miracle that Jesus performed is recorded in the second chapter of John is when he t changed a simple substance, turned a simple substance, water, into something that is quite complex called wine. And he did that at the wedding in Cana. He did this without praying. He did this without even waving his hand. He didn't even give a nod. He just did it with an act of his will. Six water pots, 20 to 30 gallons each, 120 to 180 gallons of fine wine. Now don't get too excited. I'm not that excited about it, but it's, I mean, it was fine wine. The whole party came to a standstill four days later. Oh, the best saved for last. What a wedding present. But the most important portion of this scripture, I think, is in verse 11. It says that Jesus manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Changed water into wine and the disciples believed in him. Hmm. The second of these signs is John chapter 4 from verse 46. And we read about Jesus removing a fever from a dying boy. And he did so at a great distance. He wasn't even at the boy's bedside. He was not even in the same town. And the scripture tells us that the boy's father and his whole household believed. The third miracle in chapter 5 from verse 1 is at the pool of Bethesda. And these miracles are kind of climbing up the ladder of wonder. And we are introduced to a man who is impotent in his legs, without power, and he has been in this condition crippled for 38 years. Now, this is of a different category to a fever. This is a malady that has afflicted this man for 38 years. Now, if you've ever had a cast on your limb, broken a limb, you see that it doesn't take long before the muscle to start losing its weakness and to start getting smaller and degenerate. Am I correct? 
Can you imagine after 38 years? I've seen some young people, and a man in particular I'm thinking of was in a chair for decades. His legs were thin. You could almost put your fingers around them. They're like sticks. After 38 years, this man's legs were like just hanging. This is an organic affliction. And Jesus says the following to the man. He says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Seven words, three instructions. A simple statement, but a complex miracle takes place, healing miracle. An immediate healing and regeneration of the muscle, muscle tissue and the ability to walk. Rise, their strength, suddenly whoop, the legs go into whatever the shape they were. He picks up his bed and he walks off. Wow. Praise God. Something that took four decades to that point, Jesus reversed almost instantly. The fourth sign, fourth miracle, is recorded in chapter 6, verse 1. And this miracle affected more people at any one time than any miracle Jesus performed. It was the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children. And the boy with a modest lunch of five barley loaves and two fish. Now Jesus multiplies this modest lunch into a bread and sardine buffet. A meal that fed and satisfied everyone present. And the scriptures tells us that they had all eaten to their fill. They could not get any more in. I and mean, they were satisfied. Now I heard a person once saying that, okay, that was a miracle, but the greatest miracle was that when the little boy handed his little lunch and his act of generosity so inspired these tight-fisted Jews that they all whipped out their lunch boxes from inside their clothes and all decided, okay, I do have some lunch. I'm going to share it with others. And, and they all shared the food amongst each other. No, they didn't bring the food with them. Because the Bible tells us in all four Gospels this miracle is recorded. And it brings a lie to the theory that the people had already brought some food with them. Because the fragments that were picked up were 12 baskets full of the barley loaves and fish. There were no tacos and, and guacamole and uh, empanadas and whatever else in there. There were no cinnamon buns left over. No tamales. Oh. Only five loaves and a whole chunk of sardine. That proves there is only that food group that multiplied. Generously feed thousands of people, and when the meal is over, you have 12 baskets of the fragments of the same meal remaining. Amazing. So no wonder when the people heard this, these were the words they exclaimed. This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. And they try to make Jesus king. So far, all four of these signs have got the people to exalt him and declare that he is the Messiah. So the fifth sign in John 6, verse 16, our Lord placed his disciples into a boat and sent them over the Sea of Galilee towards Capernaum, or Capernaum, which means place of comfort, over to the western side. It's interesting that Jesus had a home in the place of comfort. And he says, get in the boat and go to the western side, to that town. And as they were sailing in the night, the disciples got caught in a bad storm. And it blew them far down south. And they couldn't make headway against the storm. The next thing in the night, Jesus appears to them walking on the water. Now, there's no CGI, computer-generated imagery and, you know, movies and stuff. I mean, this is real life. Imagine you sitting in the boat and you see Jesus walking on the water. It's got your attention. Now, Jesus found the boat at that night. They were blown off course. And one thing, first miracle, is that he found them. And he caught up to the boat. That's a second miracle. Right? And he climbed into the boat. And the scripture says that immediately they were at the land where they were going. So Jesus climbs in and boom, instant warp speed to their destination. For all the trekkies out there. Matthew's gospel records that when the disciples saw this, they worshipped Jesus. And they said, truly, you are the son of God. 
If I was in that boat, I would have had the same reaction. How about you? So the next miracle, the sixth one now, is in chapter 9 of John. And it's a remarkable in that we are introduced to a man who had been born uh, blind, or he was blind since his birth. From verse 1. And now this, think about it, this miracle is in a different category to the healing of the functional illness where Jesus healed the man's legs. And it's beyond that organic and bad he uh, healing of the, um, uh, the fever. This is in a different category. The Lord did not restore this man's sight. To restore something means it was there to start with. This man was born blind. He had never seen. Jesus gave him his sight. He might have even created his eyeballs. I don't know. What a creative miracle. Only the Son of God can create, right? And finally, two chapters later, the seventh sign, John chapter 11, that the Holy Spirit has given us. We have the marvel of a man who had died and been laid in a tomb for four days. We know him as Lazarus, Jesus' friend, right? And the Jews knew that by this point, that Lazarus', Lazarus flesh had already started decomposing and that there was a distinct um, odor and stink about him. They said so. He stinketh. This was a terminal case. And with a command, Jesus raises Lazarus from dead. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And in a moment. Because he was wrapped up in grave clothes, right? Do you think he floated out? That would have been even more exciting. It's like God says to us, follow the signs. Let's think about the sequence of these signs that the Holy Spirit has arranged in the Gospel of John here. From the least difficult, I guess, to the most impossible in the realms of material things and physical illness. Transformation of matter, water, to wine, to the multiplication and quantity, bread and the fish. And finally, the transcendence of the laws of nature and physics, walking on the water, transporting himself on the boat, and all the disciples several miles to the other shore on the other side in an instant. And right through the functional miracles of the man unable to walk for 38 years, the born blind malady and the terminal case of Lazarus. It's like God comes to us and he says, <clears throat> do you believe that Jesus can turn water into wine. Do you believe he can do this with water? And we go, uh, uh, yes. Um, okay, then do you believe that someone who can do that, that can remove a fever from a boy, uh, you know, change water into wine, that he could remove fever from a boy? We go, um, yeah, sure, I'm sure he can do that. Yes, we find ourselves nodding. Now let me talk to you about a man with a physical problem of 38 years. And now let's try out on the th feeding of thousands of people with only five loaves and two small fish. Do you think Jesus could do that? We find ourselves nodding. Yes. Yes, of course. Yes, God, God, he can certainly do that. He says, now, do you believe Jesus could give life to dead people? And before we answer, God says, because if you can't, you're all lost without hope. Because our victory is in the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And our sins are forgiven. And he most certainly did do that. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We go back to that verse opened with in John chapter 20. It says, but these things have been written. These things that I've gone through have been written. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you may have life in his name. Jesus came to give us a rich and satisfying life. God cares about you. So that man's opinion that Jesus was a son of God like we all are, just at a different level, that's not true at all. He is 100% man, 100% God. And we have a man sitting at the right hand of the Father right now in heaven, this new covenant that we have with God is sealed by the blood of a man, and his name is Jesus. 
And he's sitting in heaven pleading, you're in my case. His blood is on the altar. And we are forgiven because of him. He is the solution to all problems. So who is this Jesus we are talking about as we land this plane? The solution to all our problems. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. Can we see there are two persons here? And verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why did He dwell among us? He said, I've come to show you the Father, because I don't do or say anything unless the Father show me or tell me. Total submission. I've come to show you the Father dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. So God says, let me show you seven signs that were written to, so that you would believe in the Son of God, because He's filled with grace and truth. What does that mean, He's filled with grace and truth? Well, if God only showed grace that means He would love you no matter what, and He does. No matter what we choose, He loves us. But grace alone is meaningless because it doesn't provide any guidance. Grace and truth, if Jesus came only to assert the law, well, that's mean. Because you offend in one, you offend in all. Guilty, charged, in jail. That's mean if it's only truth. But Jesus brought the balance. He brought grace and truth. And when you have grace and truth, the love of God and the obedience to God, you bring them together. It keeps you on that narrow road. And now it is meaningful. It's not meaningless or mean, but meaningful. And we have to balance that in life. God's grace covers a multitude of sin, but His truth guides and directs us so we can enjoy a rich and satisfying life. Grace and truth. Amen? So no matter how big the problem, God will always, is more than enough, more than able to take care of any challenge in our lives. And no matter how small we think the problem is, God is always interested in the tiniest details of our lives. He is a Father who loves and cares. And John cements this in a verse in his first epistle to the church in 1 John 4.15, and he says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So who is this Jesus? Does he care? Sure, he does. He never forsakes us. He never leaves us. How would you like Jesus to impact your life? Because there are many ways that he can solve the problems for us, but he's always the solution, past, present, and future. And the Bible, I'm going to read just a few of the titles and, and uh, positions that Jesus holds so that He can help us with a rich and satisfying life. And do you perhaps know Him as our advocate? Does He plead our case? He surely does. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There's nothing beyond Him or before Him. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the bread of life, and He sustains us through all things. He's the chief shepherd, the power of God, the Christ, the wisdom of God, the Christ, the Son of God. He's our chief counselor. He's our deliverer. He's the eternal life, the door to eternal life. Come on now, can we get excited here? He's Emmanuel, God with us. Eternal life is given to us through Him. He's the faithful and true. He's God manifest in the flesh. He's God our Savior. He's the heir of all things. He's our high priest. He's the image of God. He's the King of kings, the Lamb of God, the light of the world. Are we getting excited? He's the living bread. He's the Lord of lords. He's the Lord our righteousness. He's the Lord God Almighty. He's mighty in battle. He is the Lord your Redeemer. He's the Messiah. He's the mighty God. He's mighty to save you in all things. He's the power of God for everything. He's the great physician in any ailment. He's the Prince of life, Prince of peace, our Redeemer. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the rock of our salvation. Can you sit still? I can't. He's the Savior of the world. 
He's the greatest servant that has ever lived. He's the shepherd and the overseer of all our souls. He's the son of God, son of man, the teacher of good things. He's the true God, the way, the truth, and the life. He's the wisdom of God. He's the word of God. He's the way and the word of life, which is, which was, which is to come. He's the eternal one. He's the I am, that I am, the almighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We celebrate you, Lord. Woo. I'm telling you, this is Red Bull in our soul. Amen. It's better than Red Bull. This is the Son of God. This is our Jesus. He's our everything. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking. God cares about you. Amen. Woo. Let's land the plane right here. God is a good God. I don't know about you, but that put a spring in my step today. We're going to go into the child dedication, and that is no less significant or important. It is a biblical practice. So I'm going to ask the parents who brought children, if you wouldn't mind going to the side in that corner over there, and let's just all maintain that. But while they're getting their children ready, I want to just to pray for all of us here today, because... You know, we do go through challenges, and we get excited, and the Word of God has pumped your heart full of faith this morning, right? So now is the time to exercise that faith. So say this with me. My Heavenly Father, He loves me beyond measure. Jesus is the solution to all my problems. God is a good God. I submit to Him, spirit, soul, and body, socially and financially. I resist the devil, and he flees from me, as in terror. He's not an issue in my life. I am focused on the goodness of God. He provides all my needs. He heals all my diseases. He takes care of me in every way. His favor surrounds me as a shield. He guides and directs me. He guides my witnessing. He guides my talk. He's the author and the finisher of my faith and the rapture is one day closer today in Jesus name hallelujah praise God now we're excited about the rapture but there's still a lot of work to be done amen and we're going to occupy until Jesus comes I trust the word helped you this morning did you make some notes because if someone comes to you and says who is this Jesus Woo, I'm so glad you asked <laughs> because you're all paper right let me tell you, sit down. Now listen, when the devil comes and he says, you can't do this, can't do that, say, Mr. Devil, with due respect, please just take a seat. Let's discuss this. Okay, he sits down and I say, Mr. Devil, let me just tell you, who great is he that's in me than he, you? No, no, don't run away. Sit down, sit down, sit down. And let me take you through all these wonderful signs. Let me tell you this. And every time he tries to get up, say, sit down, because you you're chopping him with the sword. If he tries to tell you bad things and lie to you, then tell him about his future. Amen. Hallelujah. We're on the victorious side. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is a good God. Hallelujah.